You can hear this, the echoes of this, of race doesn't matter, race matters, from the beginning. When the Harlem store opened, Magic Johnson and Howard Schultz were there, talking about the meaning of the store. From the start, this was an odd partnership, but not for obvious reasons. As a kid, Schultz played basketball on Brooklyn's asphalt courts, and he still plays pickups and likes to tell reporters this a couple times a week. <laughs> After the coffee business made him a very rich man, he bought a steak, which he has since sold, in, NBA Seattle Superson in the NBA Seattle Supersonics. But the two smiling businessmen had, Schultz insisted, more than basketball in common. He told a reporter when Irvin, which was a name that actually only Johnson's friends called him, and I first met, there were lots of similarities in how we grew up. I would characterize it as growing up on the other side of the tracks. What was Schultz saying here? Not many people where I grew up in a racially divided town in South Jersey would characterize these things this way. Railroad tracks ran right down the middle of my hometown, Vinyl, New Jersey. Here and in most places, those tracks divided white families from black and Latino families. Still, Schultz persisted. Irvin and I had a natural connection about the values of the working class. And when we talked about the visions of opening Starbucks together in underserved communities, it was a natural connection. Ever since they got out of the projects, Schultz's words for the all, largely all-white public housing project where he grew up in Brooklyn and the modest single-family house Magic was raised in, the two of them wanted the Coffee King maintained to give something back. What Schultz didn't talk about was race, because the store in Harlem and the narratives he constructed were built to suggest that race didn't matter. But of course it did, as his, as his coded language about tracks and projects suggested. When Magic's turn came to speak, he didn't talk about growing up in the projects or his natural connection with Schultz. He spoke about race and how it, how it definitely mattered and how it shaped city landscapes. After retiring from basketball, Johnson explained he went into business, the business of getting rich and the related business of racial uplift. When he discussed his corporate life, he talked about economic self-empowerment more than brotherhood and sounded more like a Malcolm X soundbite than one from Howard Schultz or Martin Luther King. He wanted equality of access and equality of opportunity to spend. Integration and universalism didn't really figure into his vision. Unlike some supporters of diversity, Max didn't necessarily picture whites and blacks sitting, sitting together over lattes. He was looking for places for understored, middle and upper income African Americans to go to and get quality status conferring goods. Companies, he noted, with race clearly on his mind, still have that fear of coming into minority communities. National brands could turn a profit where, he explained, everyone wasn't poor and without money, but he insisted they had to deliver high quality goods. I'm about making money, Magic said without apologizing, making sure urban America gets the retail it deserves and needs. African Americans, he continued, want brands like suburban America wants, and they don't mind paying for it as long as it's the best in class. Asked about its hopes for the area around the UCO stores, he answered striking another chord of black nationalism over Merdelli and universalism. I want to see more business in this community, and that means more jobs for black people and more social income. To get the cycle started, Magic reached out to corporate America with a new product. On one level, he sold the middle class black customers. African Americans, he told executives, have money to spend, but nowhere to spend it. Implicitly, he touched upon Babylon and some of the ch uh, changes going on in urban America. African Americans, he suggested, wanted to show off their growing incomes through a little conspicuous consumption. Open outlets on the other side of the tracks and provide a few jobs, and you will, Magic promised, find a sturdy base of people with money to spend. Sony Liston, Burger King Liston, TGI TGIF Liston, if they're still in business, <laughs> Lowe's Theaters Liston, and eventually so did Howard Schultz. And Magic did his PR part. He paid Schultz back the way the CEO probably wanted to pay back, be paid back. When the Harlem store opened, he told a pack of reporters on hand with a hand on Howard Schultz, Starbucks, he said, is being very courageous. Still, Magic said in another way that Schultz wouldn't dare utter out, utter, utter out loud that race mattered. He told a Chicago reporter, we don't eat scones. We try to serve pound cake and some things that we, we eat and we like. It's a little sweeter, he said. Schultz and other business people followed Magic's lead, no, no doubt wanted black business, but that wasn't the only thing on their agendas. As much as they wanted urban dollars, they wanted Magic's praise. 
His stamp of approval demonstrated that for these companies, race didn't matter, at least as long as profits remained high. Corporate engineered social um, post-racialism had value to the company's core audience of well-paid and educated whites, and surely to some African-American customers as well. Sometimes, though, Starbucks let slip that race mattered, that not everyone shared the same histories, and that as a result, we might not exactly all be alike. Typically, Starbucks doesn't franchise. To ensure predictability, it opens stores by itself and owns them outright. But in foreign countries, it operates a little differently. Looking for help with tax and planning policies and what it calls local folk and foodways, the coffee giant teams up with an established retail partner from that part of the world. The one U.S. exception to this rule is the UCO Magic Johnson stores. Starbucks formed a partnership with Magic Johnson, Develop Corp Magic De Johnson Development Corporation, presumably paying for its expertise in understanding of how black folks consumed. Through this argument, argument, Starbucks hinted, but of course never said, that it saw inner city black and Latino areas as akin to foreign territories. It was at least a tacit admission that race mattered, that something more than simple prejudice divided us. Even when it attracted middle class African American customers, Starbucks seemed to be saying it didn't fully know what they wanted. Helped along by the media, many suburban Americans view places like Harlem through the same lenses as Starbucks is virtual foreign lands. They often imagine the world of urban, the code word that Starbucks and others use for economically distressed black worlds, as not quite civilized, and as metaphoric jungles. If the urban world is a world apart, then Starbucks becomes an agent of civilization, bringing the benefits of the modern world to a backward place. How else would a creative class describe a place in 2005 without a Starbucks? The very absence of a Starbucks marked the place outside <laughs> the mainstream. Opening a Starbucks again means bringing civilization, and this then is something of a colonial narrative that Starbucks is constructing. So Starbucks came to Harlem, to Compton, and to Seattle's central area to make money, but the stores also represent a gift, a gift, to cons a gift of consumer opportunities in every day luxury that, give the, that the firm gives to people who live in urban areas. To give a gift, you must have something to give, but you get, as the giver, something back as well. In this case, Starbucks gained moral capital by opening in, the, in areas defined as urban, when not all companies would, as well as the moral capital, capital earned in contemporary America by lending a helping hand and by saying that race doesn't matter. As it made these moves, the company distinguished itself and its customers from other brands, positioning itself as a tolerant, yet still successful company that cared about diversity and the promotion of equal opportunity. Here, race matters. Howard Schultz plays his part in staging the race matters, race doesn't matter narrative that Starbucks sells. There's a Starbucks store at the bottom of the CEO's retro Seattle office. There's another one down the street, a couple more only a few blocks away. But Schultz regularly drives visiting journalists a few miles away, going past African American churches and soul food restaurants to the Starbucks at 23rd and Jackson. This is the part of town where Ray Charles first started to blend pop sounds with gospel and Quincy Jones learns his jazz chops.